I'd like you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians, the third chapter. And as you're turning there, I want you to kind of get ready because I'm going to get you to mark that spot because I'm going to have you to turn some places else as well. So uh, Ephesians, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 5 first. Let's do it backwards. Pastor, you're messing me up. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 first and then mark your place in Ephesians chapter 5. And then after you've found your place in Ephesians chapter 5 and mark it, then look for Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start there. So Ephesians chapter 5 and and then Ephesians chapter 3. You know, this, this pandemic that we're dealing with, this crisis, this pandemic that we're dealing with has had a major impact on our most valuable resource. This pandemic has had a major, major impact on our most valuable resource. And I'm not talking about our economy. I'm not talking about our gross national product. I'm referring to something that has greater value than both of these things individually. I, I'll tell you, it has greater value, greater importance than both of these things that I just mentioned put together. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. You didn't ask, but I'm glad you asked. The family. I'm referring to the family. The, the greatest asset we have, the most valuable resource we have is the family. Information is beginning to come in on the impact that this crisis has had on families. It's interesting to find out with some families, the inability to leave their home and the prolonged interaction with each other has caused a rise in tension. A rise in tension in relationships, a rise in tension in the homes, and even has led to an increase in some areas, uh, some homes in domestic violence. It's a reality. The impact that this pandemic has had on families. On the other hand, in some other families, the extra time spent together has, re has resulted in stronger bonds, stronger relationships, closer relationships. So what's the difference? There, there has to be a difference if, if the same pandemic, if the same uh, in situation of social interaction, if in one family it's causing greater tensions and, and some situations leading to domestic violence, but in other relationships, other families, other homes, uh, it's causing stronger relationships, closer bonds. What's the difference? Now, somebody would say right off the bat, well, one's Christians and one's not Christians. And I, I'm sorry to tell you this morning, that's... That's not the truth. That's not the difference. That's not the case. I believe the difference lies in the ability to rediscover the value of family. Did you hear what pastor just said? I believe the, distant, the, the difference uh, is found in the ability to rediscover the value of family. See, we've looked beyond, or we need to look, we have to look beyond our immediate family to begin to understand the value of family. I, I want to take us outside of looking at our immediate family because we have to look beyond our immediate family to begin to understand truly what the value of family uh, really is. See, your family roots are grounded in heaven. Your family roots are grounded, grounded in heaven. Look with me now to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 beginning at verse 14. I'm going to look at verses 14 and 15 right now. Keep your Bibles open though. Going to go back to Ephesians chapter 3. In a little while we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. So Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. For this reason... For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom, now, the first part, 14, is powerful. I bow my knees to who? The Father. Now, he's God, right? He's always been God. He always will be God. But here, specifically, the scripture designates him as 
Father. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 15. This is powerful. Verse 15 says, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Amen. The whole family that in heaven and earth is named. See, our families did not begin with us. Come on. Our families did not begin with us. We get this mental mindset that our families begin and end with us, that we are the, we are the end all when it comes to our families. Everything is wrapped up in our notions, our perceptions, our decisions that uh, regard our families. And how many of y'all know that your decisions affect your families? Come on, how many of y'all realize that? Yes. But that's not the beginning of our family. And I'm not just talking about the beginning of families as far as history goes. I'm talking about the right now, real time truth about our families. The roots of our family uh, begins in heaven. See, our families didn't begin with us. They originated with God and have been given to us as a gift. Woo, I'm about to get myself into trouble. Y'all ready? Might as well just go ahead and jump in, right? You know, it might be all right in some circumstances to re-gift at Christmas. But it's not okay to re-gift when it comes to the gift of our families. Can somebody say amen today? Amen. God's given us our family as a gift. Every gift God gives has a purpose that if handled properly, benefits everyone. Every gift that God gives, if handled properly, benefits everyone involved in that gift. When we rediscover the value of family, everyone benefits. When we rediscover the true value of the gift that God has given us in our family, everyone benefits benefits from that gift. Ephesians chapter 3 goes on to describe the benefit we receive from our family connection with God the Father. So there's a benefit that we receive. God the Father, that family connection we have. Look now at verses 16 through 19. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 through 19. That he, who? God the Father. That he would grant you, who's the you? Come on, raise your hand. If you're you, if you're not sure you're you today, we'll pray for you. But if you're you, go ahead and slide that hand up. That means me. He's talking to me. I'm you. Very good. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, inner woman, inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being what? rooted and grounded in what? Love. May be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with some of the good things of God. I just can't get quite excited about that translation. Let me go back and see if I can read it better. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How many of y'all are excited about the fullness of God in your life in every aspect and in every way? Yeah. Hallelujah. Here we get a glimpse into the value of our family connection with God the Father. See, God the Father draws from his unlimited resources to strengthen us, who's us, his children, and he does it in a mighty way. Yes. By his Holy Spirit, who through our family connection has taken up residency in us. Look back at verse 16 again. That he, God the Father, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Then we see that as the connection with our Heavenly Father grows, how many of y'all, since you've given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, your relationship with God has continued to grow? How many of y'all, you're growing in your walk and relationship with the Lord? How many of y'all, your walk and relationship with the Lord has become stagnant? Don't raise your hand. 
Well, pastor, why did you say it if you didn't want me to raise your hand? I just want you to realize that there needs to be a growth pattern. See, whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are immediately brought into the family of God, right? Amen. There's no hesitancy. There's no quarantine area. Well, you know, we just brought you out of the sin of the world. You know, you're a little contaminated. You know, you're not really part of the family yet. You need to go over into that area, you know, stay over in that area. And then after, you know, six months or so, you know, whenever you begin to act like a Christian, you know, please don't raise your hand on this one. I just want you to think about it. How many of you all have had Christmas gatherings, Thanksgiving gatherings, other big holiday gatherings, Fourth of July gatherings, and you're inviting the family to come or you're going to where the family is to be there and in the process of thinking about all that and the family that's going to be there, is there a family member that crosses your mind that you think, oh boy, what's going to happen when they show up? Don't raise your hand. Now, you're not going to believe this. I know this is going to just blow your mind, but there are those individuals who have been uh, accepted into the family of God. They've asked God to forgive them of their sins. The Holy Spirit has taken them out of the camp of the enemy from under the power of Satan and has put them in the family of God and under the grace of God, and they don't act like they ought to act as believers. Now, I know you don't know that, but I'm just kind of letting you know. Reality is... All of us have not acted like we should at times. Come on. But yet we're still the children of God. And when we choose to allow the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells in us to cause us to grow, that's what pastor is talking about now. Not being stagnant, not, not coasting through our Christian life, but earnestly and fervently seeking a deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As that connection with our Heavenly Father grows, so does our understanding of the power of God's love for us. Verse, let's, let's take a moment, 17 and 18. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and depth or length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes understanding. You know about every time I think that I understand how deep God's love is for me he takes me to another level of how much he loves me. Come on how about you? He loves you. Your heavenly father loves you. If somebody else this week has caused you to feel unloved, I want to tell you it's not your heavenly father because your heavenly father loves you. Can I get an amen this morning? And the more we receive of God's love, the more we receive the heavenly father himself. Let me tell you that again. The more we receive of God's love, the more we receive of the heavenly father himself. Pastor, did you make that up? No, there at the end of the verse, that you may be filled with all what? The fullness of God. Amen. See, our families are to be an extension of our relationship with God. Our families are to be an extension of our relationship with God. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5 with me now. Ephesians chapter 5. When you get to chapter 5, look down until you find verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Verse 31 says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now that's powerful, that's important. That deals with our natural family, our natural relationships, but it's also spiritual in nature. Uh, individuals think that marriage is simply a contract, a legal agreement here in this world, in this life. I have to tell you that that's only a small part of it. It's spiritual and powerful. But I want you to look at the next part, verse 32. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. See, both relationships, the relationship of husband and wife and the relationship of Christ and the church 
are a part of the family of God. The relationship of husband and wife and the relationship of the, the Christ and the church are part of the family of God. See, a man and a woman joining together to extend the natural family, right? I was in a little discussion with somebody and they were talking about uh, two individuals going to have a long-term, long-distance relationship, you know, and it would be okay because this one could travel there and then to go back and all this stuff. And and I said, I said, well, I don't know how that would work. And they said, well, it could work out. I said, uh, yeah, but isn't the purpose of a dating relationship isn't the purpose to head towards marriage? So how's their marriage going to work out? See, we have to understand, we, we, we tend to have a, have a secular, cultural mindset when it comes to things. We allow the world to reteach us and how relationships ought to be and the value and the importance of those relationships. But here's, here's reality. God, God calls a, a man and a woman to come together with the purpose of creating a marriage which creates children, whether those children are naturally born to that couple or whether they're adopted into that relationship. And so the natural family can be extended for the kingdom of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. And then you and I joining together with Jesus to extend the spiritual family. So we're talking about two different relationships, but they're heading in the same direction. The natural family and the spiritual family are joined together into the one family of God. And since the value of family originated in heaven, doesn't it make sense that we should look to heaven for our example of the family? Now, I better make sure that you all agree with that because there's no sense in me preaching the rest of this message if we're not in agreement that if family originates in heaven, right, that we need to look to heaven for the example and the model of how family ought to be. Come on. Are we in agreement on that? Thank goodness, because I had nothing else to say if you didn't agree with that. Now, the truth is, I'd have kept preaching it anyway. <laughs> Because we need to hear it. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. Boy, it's so much more fun to have you all in here. <laughs> See, husbands and wives, husbands and wives, you set the example of love and respect in your home. Husbands and wives, dads and moms, you set the example of love and respect in your home. Pastor, where do you get that from? I'm glad you asked again. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Pastor, you ask your question. You ask the question before we get a chance. I know, I know. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Look at it. So again, I say, because he already said this earlier in the passage, and I encourage you to go back and read the whole passage. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Right? Is that what the scripture says? Linda, did I read it right? She said, I don't know, Pastor. Husbands, you set the tone of love in your home. Yes. See, there's this mindset because women have a loving, naturing uh, spirit about them. And I just preached about that last Sunday. That the thought is, well, women set the tone of love in the home. And I'm telling you, it's not. The women don't set the tone of love. The husband sets the tone of love in the home. I'll explain to you why. Gentlemen, if your love is conditional, if your love is conditional, then your family will learn to withhold love. Guys, if we fall into the trap of saying, well, if I express love, if I demonstrate love and they're not doing the things they ought to be doing, I need to withhold that love until they do the things they ought to be doing. And once they're doing the things the right way, then I'm going to show them my appreciation by demonstrating love. Sir, if you withhold love, if your love is conditional upon the performance of those in your family, then your family learns to withhold love until the performance of the individuals that they're in a relationship comes up to that level that they feel like they can give love. However, however, if you follow Jesus' example of unconditional love, 
You know, whatever Jesus, I love this story because it's so powerful. When Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized, right? Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized. And we know John didn't want to baptize him because he knew who Jesus was. He said, I need you to baptize me. But, but Jesus said, no, to fulfill all righteousness, I need to be baptized. So Jesus was baptized. You remember what happened the moment Jesus came up out of the water? The heavens opened up. And Father God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am what? well pleased wait a second Jesus hadn't done his first miracle yet he hadn't held his first crusade he hadn't taught his first lesson he hadn't raised his first person from the grave but his heavenly father loved him not because of what Jesus did or what he's going to do he loved him because he loved Jesus can somebody say amen this morning that's unconditional love See, whenever we love, gentlemen, when we set the example, when we love unconditionally like Jesus loves as his example, then the love that flows in your home will create an unbreakable bond. Men, when we set the tone of love in our home, when we love unconditionally, we will create an unbreakable bond. The love that will flow in the home will create an unbreakable bond. See, your words and actions to your wife set the example of the love of Christ for your family. I got to stand before you and tell you that there are times that Jonathan and Krista heard me respond to Fran in a way that wasn't demonstrating the fullness of the love of Christ. Come on. So now I just took the pressure off of every man in this house. If I stand in front of you in that camera with this microphone and admit that, sir, don't you tell me that you've never had a crossword with your wife where your children heard it and witnessed it. So we made a mistake, right? It's what we do about the mistake. Come on, right? It's what whenever it comes to our, when we come back to our senses, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us and says, buddy, you messed up big time. It's what we do then, right? We don't want to continue to do those things. We want to demonstrate the love of Christ, the unconditional love of Christ. We want to speak love to our wife so that our children will see that love in us and understand a God's love for them. Can somebody say amen? amen? But when we mess up, we make it right. And then we teach individuals how to apologize and how to set things right whenever they mess up because they're going to mess up and they need to see a godly example of what you do when you mess up. Can somebody say amen? amen. Whew, glory. Hallelujah. Then your children will understand the unconditional love that you have for them. When they see it demonstrated to your wife, then they'll understand the unconditional love that you have for them. Listen, loving unconditional is not condoning bad behavior. Loving unconditionally is not condoning bad behavior. Instead, it's helping them correct their behavior so that they can become all that God intended them to be. See, you and I as Christians, we can truly understand what love really is. Uh, see, the world has a concept that if you really love somebody, you just let them be themselves. Drives pastor crazy. They can't even advertise a soda. For those of you up north, that's a pop. <laughs> For those of you in the Midwest, it's Coke. It Coke's anything, Sprite, right? Some of y'all Coke's anything, it's not a pro, yeah, okay. And, and so we, we, we begin to understand that we're not condoning the bad behavior because if you truly love somebody, you tell them what they need to know. You tell them the truth. But what's the difference? George, you tell them in love, don't you? You tell them because you love them and you say it out of love. You don't say it because you're frustrated. You don't say it because you're angry. You don't say it because you're mad. Well, pastor, I have. Yeah, join the club. Everybody in this room, if they'd be honest, has said something out of frustration, out of anger, out of whatever. And some of you all, I can't believe this. Some of you all said it because you wanted them to hurt as much as you did. 
I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand who's guilty with that because I'd make somebody lie. <laughs> but what do we do? The scripture says, speak the truth. Amen. But what? Speak it in love. See, when the love of God is in your home, so is the fullness of God's presence. Come on. Isn't that what the scripture said? Pastor got that from the word of God. When the love of God is in your home, so is the fullness of God's presence. Your home cannot be defeated when the fullness of God's presence is in your home. Can somebody say amen? amen. Wives, are you ready? Wives, you set the tone of respect in your home. You set the tone of respect in your home. See, if your respect for your husband is conditional, oh boy. Ooh, I'm going to say something now. If your respect for your husband is conditional, then the condition may never be right for him to receive your full respect. If he's got to hit all the benchmarks for you to show him respect, he's probably not going to hit all the benchmarks to receive the fullness of your respect. Trust is earned. Respect is given. Trust is is earned but respect is given pastor what do you mean well your husband earns your trust through his love the more he demonstrates that genuine love to you the more you learn to trust right you get to that place where you know that love is unconditional and genuine you know your husband cherishes you boy that 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 trust just grows in that atmosphere but respect. He is to receive respect because he's your husband. That starts, that starts from the moment whenever you say, I do. When your children see you respecting your husband, they will learn to give him respect as well. Now, you might think I'm meddling, but I'm telling you, this is good preaching. Ladies, I have seen situations where wives and moms have allowed the foxes to get in the hen house by doing little things to undermine their husband's respect. Well, dad said for us not to do this, but just don't tell dad and we'll go do it anyway. It's just a little thing. It's just a little thing. And you don't really mean anything by it except for little thing builds on little thing builds on little thing and then there starts this culture in the home where you're doing things behind the husband and the dad's back and the kids know about it and you know about it and you realize it's not a big thing but those kids are learning not to respect dad just do it behind his back now husbands I'm not going to get to the scripture that says don't exasperate your children but let me just throw it in here now don't make ridiculous rules and regulations that's hard for your children and your wife to follow. Come on, can somebody say amen? amen. Well, women, I gave you an opposite, a wonderful opportunity to shout there. <laughs> Praise God. But it's that respect, it's given. It has to be given. It, it can't be earned. It has to be given. You say, well, you don't know my husband. Well, if you want him to be better than he is now, start showing him the respect that he deserves. See, respect freely given in a home dem is demonstration of love in action. Ladies, it's, your heart is set towards love. You have that feeling of love and emotion. You want to love. But love has to be an action. And for that love to be real, it has to go into action. For your husband, for a man, it's respect. Listen, for a man to feel loved, he has to feel respected. If a man feels respected, he feels loved. For a woman to feel respected, she has to feel loved and cherished. Not like the guy that was working with his buddy on fixing his car 
And his buddy says, well, your anniversary's coming up. What are you gonna do for your wife? He said, well, you know, I was thinking about buying a couple of Bears tickets for, for the game. He said, is that gonna show her love? Well, she don't need to know love. We're just gonna go do something together. Don't you think you need to tell your wife you love her? He said, well, you know, I told her when we got married I loved her and I told her if anything changed, I'd let her know. Guys, don't think everything's all right in your marriage relationship just because you're happy with the things or way things are going. Come on, women. I just gave you an opportunity to shout. But ladies, if you really want to love your husband, let him know you respect him. And he'll feel that love. Gentlemen, if you want your wife to feel like she's respected, then cherish her. Don't just say, I love you, honey. Cherish her. Come on. There's a little princess or a queen in every side of every lady, right? Come on. Amen. Amen. Respect provides a safe platform from which disagreements can be resolved. If there's mutual respect in the home, how many of y'all know you're going to have disagreements, but if there's mutual respect in the home, that creates a safe platform from which disagreements and disputes can be resolved. Children. Boy, I wish there was a whole lot more children. Y'all are going to have to just share this, right? Children set the tone of honor in the home. Children set the tone of honor in the home. Ephesians chapter 6. Just look down a little further there in chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1, 2, and 3. Children obey your parents because you, what's it say? Because you belong to the Lord. There's that family connection again, isn't it? The roots of our family are grounded in heaven. Uh, Children obey your parents because you belong to the Lord for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. Oh, yeah. And you will have a long life on the earth. You know, once again, the earthly family is connected to the heavenly family. Children honor their heavenly father by showing honor to their parents. When a, when a child honors their parents, they're actually showing honor to the Heavenly Father. Honoring parents is not a suggestion, but a requirement for God's blessings. Isn't that what it says? Verse 2, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment, not suggestion, the first commandment with a promise from God. Honor like respect in the family is given, not earned. Uh, you know, before I was become senior pastor, I was a youth pastor. Well, I had several positions, but I was a youth pastor at one point. Some of y'all are looking at me and said, pastor, you never were a youth pastor. Yes, I was. I promise you. And I had several students that came to me and we were preaching and teaching and ministering on honor your parents. And they sat down to talk with me individually, not together, but individually. And they began sharing with me their situation at home. I have to tell you, when you talk about dysfunctional families, these were some dysfunctional families. They said, Pastor, do I still have to honor my parents? I said, here's something you need to understand. You're not honoring your parents because they deserve it in some way. You're honoring your parents because you belong to God. And God the Father has told you to honor your parents. Come on, we need to pay attention to this. Because it's the first commandment with a a promise. I told them, if you will honor your parents, God the Father will honor you. But they don't want me to read my Bible and they don't want me, I didn't, I said, I didn't say you do everything your parents tell you to do. Come on now. Are you listening? When it comes between husbands, wives, you need to pay attention to this too. When it comes between listening to God and listening to man, we listen to God. Amen. Amen. 
And if a parent tries to tell a child, don't read the word of God, don't go to church, how can they follow that? But in everything else, you can honor your parents. I've had adults where their parents weren't there for them, didn't show them love, didn't take care of them. They basically had to raise themselves into adulthood. And then whenever their parents got sickly and needed help and support, they came back in and honored their parents by helping them until they passed away. And guess what? They were able to lead their parents to the Lord Jesus Christ because of their example. And the same thing with one of those young ladies that came and talked with me as she began to go home and honor her parents even though they were acting in a way that was unchristian. They began to see Jesus Christ in her and she was able to invite them to church and after they had come to church for several months sometimes it takes a while can somebody say amen that mom and dad gave their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and now she was in a Christian home I want to tell you we don't reason these things out we simply do what God tells us to do the way he tells us to do it and he works out the details can somebody say amen, amen. You see, honor enables a child to learn respect for authority, doesn't it? Honor helps a child learn respect for authority. Honor teaches a child how to respect themselves. When a child learns what true honor is, then they understand how to show, how to learn respect for themselves. I wish I could go into a little bit more detail on these. Honor helps a child develop their independence in a healthy way. Come on. Honor needs to be both an expectation and a rule. You need to expect your children to honor you, but you need to make it a rule that honor is going to be shown in your home. Amen? You don't scream at them while you're trying to get them to honor you. That doesn't work. Come on. Honor is key to the success of any family. Amen. Amen. See, the constant interaction of staying at home through this crisis will bring out the good and the bad in any family. That's reality. You put people together for a long period of time, it's going to bring out both the good and the bad in any family, in any relationship. The good should be praised. Now, let me tell you that. Don't, don't, don't let it just slide by. You know, if, if somebody in your family is doing something good, give them praise for it. Lift them up. Tell them how much you appreciate it. Recognize what they're doing. Don't take them or it for granted. Good things ought to be praised, ought to be celebrated on a regular basis. And this is my perfect place to celebrate something. Friday. There was a team of individuals that came to the church early on Friday morning and started cutting and chopping and cooking and preparing. We had folks on one counter cutting up mushrooms, somebody on another counter cutting up onions, somebody else cutting up peppers, somebody else cutting up chicken, somebody else sauteing the chicken, somebody else sauteing the vegetables. We started putting it all together layer by layer till we got it in the pot. Then we realized we had to divide it into two pots and then we had to label all the waters and we had to cut the bread and we had to prepare all that. Then load it all up and drive over to the sheriff's department and set up our canopies outside the sheriff's department and get ready to serve the sheriff's department. We served the whole sheriff's department on Friday and they were blessed and they loved it and the sheriff was excited about it. But your folks here at Christian Life Assembly of God in the midst of this COVID crisis went and blessed the sheriff's department and I want everybody that was here on Friday a part of that I want you to stand right now everybody was here on Friday it was a part of that I want you to stand right now amen amen praise God praise God praise God praise God praise God see that was the only right thing for me to do that was something good I needed to honor them right I needed to show them honor for what they did. Next Sunday, we're going to be honoring some more folks for some of the wonderful things that they've been doing during this crisis to keep the ministry going forth and ministering in people's lives. And so we need to celebrate the good. 
But what about the bad, Pastor? Well, I'm getting to that. The bad needs to be acknowledged and transformed. You can't ignore the bad. Come on. You can't, you can't hope that it's going to disappear, that it's going to go water underneath the bridge. When bad comes out, you need to acknowledge it. And then you need to work with the Word of God and the presence of the Spirit. And you need to get advice, get help, and you need to transform the bad. Come on. Right? This is a good time for the reshaping and strengthening of our families. God has put us in an excellent place right now. Romans 8.28, for God works all things out for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. This is an excellent time. This is a perfect time. This is a good time for the reshaping and strengthening of our families. We need to take the negatives in our family's dynamic to the Lord. Amen. If there are negatives in our family dynamic, don't allow the enemy to beat you down about that any longer. Come on, let's encourage each other in Christ. If there's some negatives going on in your home, in your family, in your relationship, don't allow the enemy to beat you down any longer about it. Take those negatives to the Lord, amen? Trust him with it, right? Trust him with it. But listen, you gotta pay attention to this next part. Start by asking him to change you. Man, we can get into long, left lengthy prayer sessions and crying out to the Lord, change my children, change my spouse, change Pastor Hensel. <laughs> we need to be praying, Lord, change me. Lord, start with me. Lord, do a powerful work in me because I know if you get me where I need to be, then you can work through me in the life of everybody else around me. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Then continue to apply the increase of love, respect, and honor in greater levels in your home. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now somebody would say to me this morning, and you haven't said it, I know I haven't given you time, but somebody would say to me this morning, Pastor, how can I be certain this will work in my family? I want to take you back to Ephesians chapter 3. Hopefully you haven't lost that spot. I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter 3 and look down till you find verse 20. This is the promise. This is how we know. This is how we know. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 it says, Now to him, to God, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus, now pay attention, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What's generations describe? The only way you get generations is families. If families stop existing, guess what? There are no more generations. All through this, God is talking about the family that is joined together, the, the heavenly family, the earthly family. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. You're the key to the transformation of your family. Come on. You're the key to the transformation of your family. But you cannot do it your way and you cannot do it on your own. But you can do it through the power and the presence of God's word and his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I pray this message has encouraged you this morning. I pray that it's uplifted your spirit and given you hope. Because when we see the reality of the word of God, and we take and we compare that to what's happening in our life and the world, we understand that there is a way through anything that we've come to combat. God always has an answer. He always has a way. And when we rediscover the value of family, you know, I've talked to a number of individuals through this process who've had to change their schedules about stuff. It's not that they're still not busy. They're, they're still busy. A lot of pressure, a lot of things on them. But they've had to change their schedule about things. And that's caused them to, to reflect on their family more and more. And as they've been reflecting on their family, God has been speaking to them about the importance and value of their family. And I've talked to a number of leaders, good men, good women, 
who coming through this, God has spoke to them. And even when they come out of this, they've already made a determination that they are purposely readjusting their schedule because they're going to spend more quality time with their family. They're going to put greater value on their family relationships.